that's uh, Andrew Wyeth's Christina's World from 1948. It's in the uh, Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York City, if you ever get the chance. And in case you missed last week, that is the poster that Nomi Nichol has over her bed. Among other things, that poster is evidence that when Nomi says there's no human condition in East Village, that she's wrong. That they are in the middle of, she claims that they're in the middle of nowhere, isolated and cut off. But the piece of poster, the poster from a museum, is evidence that she's wrong. Because despite the, the isolation and the best efforts of her community, the modern world leaks into that community. Newspapers blow in from the city. American radio stations come over the border. And posters end up on walls from museums. I suspect that Nomi put this particular poster up in her room uh, because she sees herself in it, or her mother, or both. Uh, Nomi Nichol is 16 years old. In her last year of high school, in the fictional Mennonite town of East Village, Manitoba. Her older sister, Tash, uh, ran off three weeks ago, three years ago, I should say. And her mother, Trudy Nichol, disappeared about seven weeks after her sister did. All she's got left is her father, Ray. And he's slipping away. Even the, the furniture in their home is disappearing. Nomi Nichol has a complicated relationship with home, right? It is what she wants, and it is also the source of a great deal of her pain and her confusion. In her words, she is homesick at home, homesick at home. I think that what Nomi Nichol does not want and does not miss about the Mennonite church is its fundamentalism. I think what she misses, whether she knows it or not, is the home that fundamentalism can provide. And that is the security of knowing exactly how and where to belong in the world. Because you're told where and how to belong in the world. And in that sense, as, as I think many others, Naomi Nichol is very much part of the human condition that like millions of other real and fictional people, she is suffering from the same condition of homelessness that Mark Kingwell and other contemporary philosophers have diagnosed as the condition of our time, of our increasingly rootless society, but just shows up differently in different people in different places. Knowing who you are is easy when somebody tells you who you are. But having to figure it out for yourself, that's hard. There might be another reason that, that Miriam Taves chose to hang that particular poster over Nomi's bed, a reason maybe that Nomi doesn't know, but that Taves hoped we might. And that is the story behind the painting is almost as well known as the painting itself. It looks like a young girl, it's not. It's an old neighbor woman, a spinster, who was disabled but too poor or too proud to, to buy a wheelchair, and this is how she got around. And the story is that Wyeth, who is her neighbor, looked out from his window, that's the perspective of the painting, and saw his neighbor pulling himself across the lawn. And he felt challenged, in his words, to use paint, to use his artistic medium, in order to do justice to what he called her extraordinary conquest of a life which most people would find hopeless. It's a painting about defiance. And later in the novel, Nomi Nichol is going to point that defiance at a different target than the painting does. She's going to add to the painting. She's going to put words on the painting, words coming out of that woman's mouth, and words that were told explicitly are aimed at the house, at the home. And the words are, of course, fuck you. Uh, besides their fairly obvious anxiety about home, 
Miriam Taves' books share um, a dislike and maybe a distrust of authoritative social institutions. In her first novel, Summer of My Amazing Luck, the social institutions are uh, social workers, the, the welfare office, um, the government. In Swing Low, her memoir of her father, and in The Flying Troutmans, it's the psychiatric industry, the mental health industry, pharmaceuticals, the doctors, the nurses. In A Complicated Kindness, it's high school and church. Teachers and ministers, sometimes even parents, are the one that's left. Thoroughly appropriate targets for a 16-year-old narrator. The point I want to make, which I think is really important because it got overlooked a lot, is that Miriam Taves' target is not the Mennonite church per se or the Mennonite religion. It's fundamentalism in any guise, doctrine, dogma, rules, institutions, black and white answers that tell us where we have to stand. This is Taves in an interview she gave after A Complicated Kindness. Fundamentalism offers a really simplistic, easy version of things to believe in. All those difficult, unanswerable questions that real life asks are answered. And there's no room for subversiveness or critical thinking, or even much thinking of any kind. Fundamentalism is the Berlin Wall in Hedwig and the Angry Inch, right? It's the thing that tells you where to stand and it tells you that you have to stand there. There's no movement between East and West. No going back and forth between those two places. In between, where East and West meet, is no man's land. Page 10. Last few lines on page 10. That's the thing about this town. There's no room for in-between. You're in or you're out. You're good or you're bad. Nomi's problem is not that she's, you know, especially bad, right? Her older sister, I think, was. Tash got in trouble, real trouble. And her problem is not that she's especially good, like her friend Lydia. Her problem is that she's neither. She's a misfit. She's not good or bad, she's a freak. Under her picture in the yearbook, the yearbook committee writes, do, 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 the theme from the Twilight Zone, right? She's an outsider, she doesn't fit. And that's what fundamentalism cannot tolerate. Fundamentalism cannot tolerate the in-between. People like Hedvig, people like her mother, and people like Nomi. Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I spit you out of my mouth. Like rock music spit out Hedvig. Like the Mennonite church spits out Nomi's mother, and then Nomi herself. Excommunicated, shunned, banished, exiled, whatever you want to call it, says Nomi. Call it homelessness. Um, when A Complicated Kindness was on Canada Reads, which is going on right now again, Yay, Lisa Moore, sorry. Um, when it was on Canada Reads, its defender was John K. Sampson, um, the, the front man and lead singer and main writer for the Winnipeg band, The Weaker Thans, who, like Miriam Taves, is a guest in this year's Literature for Our Time series. Miriam uh, will join us later on today. Um, Judy Gartner, pending you know, blizzards, will be here next Friday, and then John K. Sampson will join us on March the 22nd. Anyway, when. John argued on Canada Reads when he defended this book by coincidence. He said, Miriam's book is a great, sad, and funny read, but it's also totally relevant in today's world of fundamentalism and intolerance. I don't know if that's why it won Canada Reads that year. It's impossible to say why a committee chooses one book and doesn't choose another. But I can tell you, because in this case there was no committee, it's just me, I can tell you that it's why the book is in this course this year because I also think it's a great, sad, funny read, and because I also think that it is still very relevant in today's world of fundamentalism and intolerance, um, still, sadly. 
Uh, Nomi has one of the best defenses that we humans possess against that world, the world of fundamentalism and intolerance, and that's just laughter. Um, the most common note in the reviews of this book were to say that it's sad, followed closely by, and it's funny. So The Guardian says heartbreaking and humorous. Oprah Magazine says darkly funny. The Winnipeg Free Press says profoundly funny and profoundly sad. I agree, I just said so. But I don't think it's just that it's funny and sad. I think they're actually causally connected. That it's funny because it's sad or that its funniness depends on its sadness. Nothing takes the fun out of funny, like explaining how a joke works. So, you know, forgive me for what I'm about to do. But more often than not, the humor in this novel seems to me, test it for yourself, to work by pushing pathos into bathos. So what it does is it pushes really, really hard on something sad and pathetic or moving, so hard that it becomes ridiculous and silly or funny. Um, bathos means depth, as in falling. Um, bathos is when something sad or moving falls or gets pushed into the trivial or the ridiculous. An example from a recent contest uh, in the Washington Post. This is an example of bathos. She had a deep, throaty, genuine laugh, like that sound a dog makes just before it throws up. <laughs> hey, that's bathos, taking something that's making a claim to your emotions in some way and then pushing on it so hard that it becomes ridiculous and silly. A few weeks after Nomi's father left, her father builds the garbage can hutch that he has always promised he would build for her mother. So, you know, it's a wooden container or stand of some kind to put your garbage cans in at the end of the alley for when the garbage guys come by. Now, he's not a carpenter. He's never built anything in his life. He's really bad at this, and he takes days to build the thing, which should take anybody, you know, an hour to put together. But he does it because she asked for it and because she's gone and it's really all that he can do for her now. And that is sad, that is moving, that is pathos. So Nomi and her father, they take this thing on garbage day and they carry it while she puts it on her wagon. And they take it out to the end of the alley and they're proudly waiting there for the garbage guys to come up and use it for the first time and take the garbage cans away. And the garbage guys come and they take the whole damn thing. They take the garbage can hutch because they think it's garbage, it looks so bad. That's bathos. Nomi in a bonnet, dressed up for the Pioneer Church. That's pathos. That's sad. This girl, the Nomi we know, dressed in a bonnet for the Mennonite Church? That's sad. Nomi setting her bonnet on fire with a cigarette? That's bathos. Nomi says when she was little, page 87, she says when she was little, I had an imaginary friend. Pathos who hated me and wanted to kill me. <laughs> Bathos, in the same damn sentence. It's really quite remarkable. Think about it, the structuring joke of the entire book is this, pushing on pathos until it becomes bathos. Girl in small town dreaming of going to New York and hanging out with Lou Reed. That's sad. Mennonite girl in small town dreaming of going to New York and hanging out with Lou Reed. That's funny. Okay, one of the other weapons that she has in her arsenal is burlesque. Um, yes? Is she also says that she has this laughing on the outside, crying on the inside look. Laughing on the outside, crying on the inside look. Hmm, well it's the same thing, right? One is laughing on the, one is the obverse of the other. Laughing on the outside. Next piece I think it's the reverse of what I'm talking about. Right? The laughter is there, crying on the inside. I've actually got an example coming up that's very similar to that. Hang tough. Um, burlesque. Uh, so they're very similar. Um, Bathos and burlesque are both about uh, knocking things down, about pushing exalted or high things over. The difference is, I think, that burlesque wants its effects to last. Um, burlesque wants to push things down and keep them there. 
And that might be why burlesque has become or is the name of a genre of a full performance or text, whereas bathos is just a, a technique, an isolated technique. Bathos is a joke. Burlesque is satire. Burlesque has a target. Page 47. The beginning of chapter 7. Main Street is as dead as ever. There's a blinding white light in the water tower end of it, and Jesus standing in the center of it in a pale blue robe with his arms out, palms up, like he's saying, how the hell would I know? I'm just a carpenter. He looks like George Harrison in his Eastern religion period working for Ringling Brothers. Now, saying that Jesus Christ, the statue of Jesus Christ, looks like one of the Beatles is not just a joke. It is a way for Nomi to bring the church down to her level and to keep it there. And that's why she keeps saying it every time she sees the statue. It's why in church, her sister Tash, every time she's supposed to say Jesus Christ, she says instead, John Lennon. And why she keeps saying it, burlesque, to bring what is high down. It's why um, Nomi repeatedly uses silly names for the authorities in the church. Menno, I love the nightlife, Simons. Menno, sexy Simons, the mouth of darkness. Right? To bring them down and keep them there. Um, more than bathos or burlesque, Naomi's go-to defense is irony. Uh, irony is like her, it's her square button. Bathos is more like R2 or something. Page 84. First paragraph in 84, this is about her Sunday school teacher. She's talking about her Sunday school teacher. She says, about halfway through the paragraph, she could really get a buzz on from arts and crafts, particularly the ancient art of gluing macaroni onto jars and spray painting them gold. Isn't it exciting, she told us, how many ways there are to serve Jesus. She once asked me and the other girls in our class if we were gymnasts, if we were gymnasts, but really fat ones, would we think we could just go out and win an Olympic medal one day? No? Well, that's what Christianity's all about, she said. That's irony in its simplest possible form. Words that mean the opposite of what they say. Um, gluing macaroni on jars and spray painting them gold is not, in fact, a particularly exciting way to serve Jesus. Training for the Olympics is like nothing at all like Christianity. But notice that irony is rarely so obvious, and even here, one person doesn't get it, and that would be the Sunday school teacher, right? It's a very clear example of the difficulty, clearest example I've ever seen in a text, actually, of how hard it is to read irony, page 183. Middle of 183. She's talking about her boyfriend, Travis. Travis has a job at the Mennonite Museum. Travis told me, he wrote the word obey in huge letters across the length of the entire blackboard as a joke, and the mouth saw it and said he liked it. Right? The difficulty of detecting irony. Irony is hard because it's not in the text. Irony is like mass after the Higgs boson. It's, it's, not a, it's not a property of the product. It's something produced by the environment, including by the observer who is part of the environment. Nomi's environment has produced a highly ironized particle. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to give up on the physics metaphors now because they're, <laughs> they're not going to work for me much longer. Her speech is ironic. She affects an ironic look a complex combination of hostility and hopelessness mingled with sad longing and redemptive love. Her and Travis um, practice an ironic walk. They give themselves ironic haircuts. Now, we've talked in this class before about a possible end to the age of irony. Um, uh, the notion that, that, that may be part of what post-postmodern means is post-ironic. Um, even if David Foster Wallace and the others who said this are right, 
the, the literary rebels of our time are or will be uh, sincere, that doesn't mean that irony is going to go away, right? Or that it should, for that matter. Just as sincerity can be a tremendously effective weapon against too much cleverness, right? Too much hipness. So too can irony can be a tremendously effective weapon against too much belief, against too much sincerity. Think about it. Nomi's friend, Lydia Voth, is sincerely, really good. She's utterly incapable of irony. And this town is killing her. She is dying of some undiagnosed illness that sure the hell looks environmental, and they're treating it with shock therapy. Nomi needs irony so that doesn't happen to her, so she doesn't end up getting shock therapy like her best friend Lydia does. You know, one of the other ways to think about it is that maybe Nomi actually is one of David Foster Wallace's rebels, but she's just in hiding until it's safe to come out. Maybe if you scratched off her 16-year-old protective ironic coating, maybe underneath she's actually quite sincere. She admits as much. She tells Travis, I almost never meant what I said because I never knew what to say. Page 135. Last paragraph, 135. I have realized that my personal yearning to be in New York City, wandering around with Lou Reed in Greenwich Village or whatever, is for me a painful, serious, all-consuming kind of thing and is for the rest of the world a joke. When you're a Mennonite, you can't even yearn properly for the world because the world turns that yearning into comedy. It's a funny premise for a movie, that's all. Mennonite girl in New York City, Amish family goes to Soho. It's terribly depressing to realize that your innermost desires are being tested in Hollywood for laughs per minute. Part of my research for this book was to watch a movie called For Richer or Poorer. Um, Tim Allen and Kirstie Alley couple of like rich real estate people in New York who hide out from the tax man in an Amish community. It might just be the worst movie I've ever seen. Um, I learned nothing. Uh, so for us, Nomi's desire to hang out with Lou Reed is a joke. To her, it is serious, all-consuming. And that's what I meant by Byronic. Something that looks ironic, but is actually sincere. It's a lot easier to explain in art. This is by um, the American lowbrow painter Mark Ryden. It's one of my favorite examples for this point. Um, it was painted in 1994, about the same time that David Foster Wallace wrote that essay. Uh, it's called Saint Barbie. That's Byrony the best example I've ever seen of it. Something that your education and culture has trained you to the point where every fiber of your being screams that must be ironic, but it's not. It's actually completely and utterly sincere. And I know that the only way you can know such things, because of its environment, because of what I know about Mark Ryden and because of what I know about the school of painting to which he belongs, not because of the painting itself. Page 207. This is right after, bottom of the page, this is right after they give each other haircuts, her and Travis. We ran all the way to Main Street and climbed up to the top of the fire escape of the feed mill, which was the highest place in town, and kissed like crazy, hoping some early morning farmer out in his field would see us silhouetted against the rising sun and feel excited, knowing happiness was a possibility, even in a town with no bar and no train. Young lovers kissing on the top of a feed tower, silhouetted by the sun. It's a joke, right? It's an ironic cliche. It's flash dance. But maybe it's not a joke. Maybe she really means it, you know, including that it might give hope to that farmer out in the field. 
Isn't it Byronic? One of her jokes that is not a joke is what she calls her problem with endings. We looked at this before, page one. I hate these French cut pages. But for a second, third paragraph on page one, I have assignments to complete. That's the word, complete. I've got a problem with endings. Mr. Queering has told me that essays and stories generally come true, or generally come organically to a preordained ending that is quite out of the writer's control. He says we will know it when it happens, the ending. I don't know about that. I feel that there are so many to choose from. I'm already anticipating failure. That much I've learned to do. So she means that she has a problem with endings for her assignments at school. Right? She has a problem with figuring out, as I'm guessing maybe some of you do, how to bring her essays and assignments to a conclusion. But you finished the book now, so you know that she also means this book, right? That this book is an assignment for school, her final assignment, the one that she has to write in order to graduate. It's kind of a generic joke when you think about it, right? A book about growing up is itself the final assignment in growing up. For most of the novel, we think that when Nomi addresses or implies a reader, that she means us, right? That her use of you, when she speaks to us as you, does the same work for Taves that it did for, say, Stephen Leacock in his memories of his small town. And that is create a feeling of intimacy and familiarity between the speaker and the reader. In the last chapter of the novel, we learn that you is a specific person. The novel is and has been an assignment addressed to her teacher, Mr. Queering. She tells him in the conclusion to her assignment that she knows that he had an affair with her mother and that she knows that when her mother tried to break it off, he blackmailed her, attempted to blackmail her by lying about her. And she tells him that she has proof, a letter in which Mr. Queering, her teacher, threatens to make up stories about Trudy committing adultery with other men in the town and telling them out. Maybe, asks Nomi, ever so innocently, ever so sweetly, maybe you'll ask me to read my assignment to the class. Suddenly the you isn't quite so folksy, right? Suddenly it's not quite so friendly. Suddenly it's specific and it's dark. And it works retroactively, darkening the story behind you, the story you thought you knew. And if you've read Leacock's Sunshine Sketches, you know the same thing happens, though it's not quite as specific. I don't think the point of either uh, is revenge. Um, disappointment, yes. Revenge, no. Right after that revelation, Nomi rewrites her favorite quote. Life being what it is, one dreams not of revenge. One just dreams. Nomi's problem with endings is that she is tired of other people's endings being imposed on her, with having other people's stories imposed on her. When she was a younger girl, she woke up screaming because she thought her sister was going to hell, because her sister was bad. This is a little girl who truly believes that her sister's life is going to end in a lake of burning fire. Her mother begs her brother, the mouth. She says, tell her it's not true. Tell her they are just stories. Naomi says she doesn't like reading fantasy stories like Tolkien or C.S. Lewis. She doesn't like reading fantasy stories because she lives in a fantasy world. She lives in Menoland. She dreams of escaping into the pages of the real into the pages of the New York phone book. Mr. Queering and the Mouth forced an ending on her family. Nomi wants to write her own story and choose her own ending, page 245. Five lines from the bottom of 245. The stories that I have told myself are bleeding into a dream, finally, that is slowly coming true. I've learned from living in this town that stories are what matter. And that if we can believe them, I mean really believe them, we have a chance at redemption. East Village has given me the faith 
to believe in the possibility of a happy family reunion someday? Is it wrong to trust in a beautiful lie if it helps get you through life? Remember the line um, from Douglas Copeland's Generation X, the line that was so important to the British author John McGregor. Either our lives become stories or there's no way to get through them. When Nomi says on page one that I've got a problem with endings, I would guess she also means the other kind of ending, and that is, you know, the death kind. And I'm guessing that because she says that on page one, I've got a problem with endings, and then page two and three are entirely chock-a-block full of death, mostly dead chickens. Dead chickens, killing chickens with an ax, Nomi's life after high school working at the slaughterhouse, taking my place on the assembly line of death. The whole town smells like death because it's right next to the slaughterhouse. Main Street dead ends at both ends into dead fields. And just in case you missed her 16-year-old symbolism, East Village is kind of big on death. Page four. Six lines from the bottom of page four. The town office building has a giant filing cabinet full of death certificates that say choked to death on his own anger or suffocated from unexpressed feelings of unhappiness. Silentium. It's a Latin, which just means, Latin means silence. It's also the name of a Finnish goth metal band. The only thing you hear at night is semis barreling down the highway, carting drugged animals off to be attacked with knives. Do not make eye contact with those cows. People here just can't wait to die, it seems. It's the main event. The only reason we're not all snuffed at birth is because that would reduce our suffering by a lifetime. Nomi doesn't like endings because Mennonites are all about the ending. Um, we are supposed to be cheerfully yearning for death, she says. And in the meantime, and until that blessed day, our lives are meant to be facsimiles of death, or at least the dying process. In uh, Anne of Green Gables, there's a really pivotal scene in which Anne's teacher tells her, stop using your imagination and write about what you know. Nomi's teacher tells her, stop writing about what you know and use your imagination. And he does that because to him, to this assignment, the real world, the world right in front of her doesn't matter. Page 49, she says, there is not a lot of interest in the present tense here. There's not a lot of interest in the present tense here because they're only interested in the ending. If they're interested in any tense at all, it's future tense. And that's why Naomi writes, why she will become a writer, why this novel is not just a Bildungsroman, it is also a Kunstroman, and that is a portrait of the artist as a young writer. A novel about not just a person growing up, but an artist growing up. Page 53. Two-thirds of the way down the page. A tourist once came up to me and took a picture and said to her husband, now here's a priceless juxtaposition of old and new. They debated the idea of giving me some money and then concluded no. I speak English, I said. The artificial village and the chicken evisceration plant a few miles down the road are our main industries. On hot nights when the wind is right, the smell of blood and feathers tucks us in like an evil parent. There are no bars or visible exits. I think Nomi writes so she's not stuck in somebody else's story. Um, she writes to record her world, here and now. She writes in the present tense, because there's not a lot of present tense in East Village. She says, page 209, there's no other place to be. This world is good enough for you because it has to be. Go ahead and love it. Menno was wrong. And Nomi writes to remember. She writes to remember that. She writes to remember her mother, her sister, her father, and the town that she knows she's going to leave someday. And that's why there are so very many lists in this book, to help her remember. The things she remembers about her mother, like her mother saying hymns too loudly, or her mother 
took a lot of trips to the pencil sharpener in the basement because it had the word Boston on it. Or how her mother cried every time she watched the Waltons. The things she remembers about her sister, like her sister got dressed for school while listening to Nazareth's Love Hurts. Or she could take her bra off without taking her shirt off, which is apparently a high order of skill. <laughs> or her favorite perfume was Love's Baby Soft. The things she remembers about her town, rainbow pools of fire in the pits, the smell of smoking stubble, hot wind, dying chickens, the night, my childhood. Nomi did not write her assignment to get revenge on Mr. Queering or the Mouth or Menno Simons or Mennonites. She wrote it to preserve and make sense of the world, of this world. She is a lot like the boy in number 18 in John McGregor's If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things, collecting things from the street and putting them in a jar and hiding them underneath the floorboards. She's like her father, organizing the garbage and the dump in a way that makes sense to her, in a way that makes sense to him. Naomi's a writer, or she will be, so she organizes words instead of junk. Naomi fights the word with words. Her question, how do you remember a town that's not supposed to exist in the world? Page 200. How do you remember a town that's not supposed to exist in the world? Her answer? By writing it down. All of it. The dead chickens and the complicated kindness. And that is the point at which the Kunstlerman turns back into a Bildungsroman. When memory becomes not just a reconstruction of the past, but a construction of the self. Who am I? Well, I'm partly, and maybe even largely, where I came from. I knew I'd probably never see it again, says Nomi about East Village, except for every time I closed my eyes. For now, um, I suspect that just writing it down is enough for Nomi. Her, her problem with endings is also a problem with conclusions as conclusions, with closure, with deriving meaning from any of this. The Bildungsroman is supposed to culminate in a recognition of the self. The Bildungsroman is supposed to end as a genre with the protagonist figuring it out, the answer to the question, who am I? This one doesn't do that. Page 246. Last 10 lines. Truthfully, this story ends with me still sitting on the floor of my room wondering who I'll become if I leave this town and remembering when I was a little kid and how I loved to fall asleep in my bed, breathing in the smell of freshly cut grass and listening to the voices of my sister and my mother talking and laughing in the kitchen and the sounds of my dad poking around in the yard making things beautiful right outside my bedroom window. For now, it's enough, I think, just to remember. At the beginning of this term, in January, one of you sent me an email, Maria, I think, um, to talk to me about, to say that you'd gotten a chance to read this book over the Christmas break and, and that you liked it. And you said that you thought it was sad, but that you also felt reading it that, in your words, that there was a sense of hope all the way through. All the way through, that's what you said. And I've been thinking about that, and I think all the way through is exactly right. Um, this novel does not end with the kind of hope that is common to both of its genres. Both the Bildungsroman and the Kunstroman, the book about growing up and the book about becoming an artist, are supposed to end pointing you in a hopeful, redemptive gesture with Del Jordan finally getting the hell out of Jubilee and hitting the road for New York to become Alice Monroe. This novel doesn't do that. It just ends, with her still sitting there. Taves has said that she deliberately left the ending up to us, that we can take a leap of faith and decide that Nomi got out of East Village or not. The ending is our problem now. But if a complicated kindness teaches us anything is that it is wrong to do what we so often do, 
which is look to the end of the story for hope. The end of our story. Hope is or should be something that you feel all the way through our stories, including this story. In Naomi's humor, in her resilience, in all the complicated acts of kindness committed by her family and her community in realizing, as she does, that love outlasts grief, that love is even more powerful than hope. Nomi lets readers complete the verse for themselves. Faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love, fighting the word with words. In this case, it's words. And maybe most of all, or maybe just the kind of hope that I prefer, which says you something about me more than you need to know, but in the hope that she sees in the blood stain from her bike crash that she leaves above the wall of her bed in her bedroom. Because, she leaves the blood stain up there because, as she says, every time I looked at it, I was, at that very moment, reminded that I was not bleeding from my face. And those are powerful words of hope, really. Let's take a break there. Um, and when we come back, uh, Mary and Taves will join us.